Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Caitlin Elliott and today is Friday, which means it's true. It's uh, Crimes Through the Times. I was going to say True Crime Tuesday, so that's only on Tuesdays. It's Crimes Through the Times. So today's case, we're going to be talking about the boy in the box. Now, if you don't know about the boy in the box case, let me just tell you, it is horrible. It is one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life, but it is a case that was suggested to me by my husband. He's like, hey, you should do this case. It really interests me. It intrigues me. You know, a lot of people might be interested in it, end quote. So I started researching into it and I went down several rabbit holes. I got pissed off. I cried once and that was that. And so I decided, you know, I might just as well, like, get this case out there because, like I said, there's not a lot of videos out there on what had happened to the boy in the box. And to this day, it is still an unsolved case. So, I'm going to, like, the last video that we talked about was about the Ketty murders. Remember, Ketty murders? This also involves children, but this one takes place even before then. Remember, because, you know, the 80s? Yeah, this was even before the 80s. This took place in 5th. Seven, I believe 1957 so this just it infuriates me and it frustrates me and I'm sure you'll feel the same way just let me know all your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments as you watch it let me know what you think so the boy in the box so he was an unknown murder victim he was a four to six year old boy and he was found on the side of the Susquehanna Road in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in a cardboard uh, box, in a in a cardboard box that was in a, for a bassinet that was sold by J.C. Penney at the time, and his naked and battered body was found inside. And so, a bassinet. In case you know, you guys don't know what a bassinet is. I personally didn't know what it was. It was a um, bed specifically made for babies from birth to about four years old. So, like one of those little bassinets you put on the so like right beside your bed, you know, so you can watch, you know, kids. But it's gonna. It's it, this is just. It's a terrible story. He was found to have been recently have had a bath you know, cleaned and he had a haircut and he had nice trimmed fingernails. And unfortunately it looked like he had been beaten and he was bruised and he was definitely malnourished. So that was something that the police took into the case that they were, you know, they were thinking about this. This possibly could have helped them solve this victim. And he is said that the boy had multiple scars all over his body. Um, some were surgical. There was mostly scars around his ankle, his groin, and his chin. And his hair, it was said to have been roughly cut. Like someone had just done a terrible hack job at home. And he even had clumps of hair all over his body. So it said that whoever killed him just gave him a weed whacker job and you know called it a day and which is terrible to think about and it said that the cause of death of this little boy was said to have been a homicide by being beat to death a four to six year old boy was beaten to death like what the fuck so the boy in the box's identity is still unknown to this day like i said and it's still an open and active case. Like, people are still finding things that could be portrayed to it. But this is not the end of the video, my friends. Oh, nah, nah. So, on February of 1957 was when the boy's body was found in the woods. It was wrapped up in a plaid blanket. And his body was in the woods off Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase. Now, this was a little area around Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And his naked body was found inside the cardboard box from JCPenney, the one that had like the little bassinet on it. And his body was actually found by a young muskrat trapper. And the trapper initially, he didn't report the body being found because he was worried that he would be arrested for illegally trapping muskrats. And he only reported what he saw after 
the abduction of Mary Jane Barker and the murder of her came out to the news. He's like, oh, well, this might be related. You know, I might want to talk about this. You know, I might just want to put that out there, you know. And no, it took him up to that point to actually report what he said. That fucking pissed me off. <sighs> I'm going to stretch out a little bit. Ugh, sorry, I've been, like, recording, like, all day. I'm out of pain. So let's go. Let's move on. So the investigation, <coughs> excuse me, started right away. And they started the investigation on February 26th of 1957. The boy's fingerprints were ended up taking, taken from his body. Like they did fingerprints from his body. And they were taken in hopes that like people would be able to identify him. They put him out in the newspapers, like his fingerprints. They're like, does anyone recognize this boy, his fingerprints, anything out there? And nobody had come forward with any information regarding this boy. Like this poor kid had been killed. And nobody out there knows anything, like, just pisses me off, pisses me off so much. And there, the case had drawn, like, massive attention in the Philadelphia area and all over the Delaware Valley. Like, they were all interested into who this boy might have been, what happened to him, why he died, like, who he is. Everyone wanted to know everything that they could. So... 400,000 flyers. This was more than even what happened with Charlie Ross. Remember, this also happened in Philadelphia. But there was even more, like, things printed out and flyers printed out for this boy than there was back then. Like, I mean, this was big, big, big news. And they posted it with his face, his um post-mortem photo, which... I mean, if you don't know what post-mortem is, it's basically the photo that someone takes of a dead person's body to be able to identify them or, like, taking it at a funeral or, like, an open casket or anything like that. There's photos that are taken. And it said that even if, like, you were just to pay for gas in that area, the Delaware Valley area, Philadelphia, everything, just in the state of, like, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia you were to get a receipt and on the receipt on the back of it it was a picture of the boy on it so, I mean, well back then like they just handed people a bill and like hey here's what you pay right you know what i mean it wasn't like one of those like credit cards you know where you give people cash and it can make it work because technology no you just basically like you were given gas and then after that they hand you a bill and you were told to pay it with either cash or check because they didn't have card so, like I said, that was printed out with the boy's picture on it. So, in hopes that, you know, people would come forward with any type of information. So, the police, they began searching the area where the body was found to see if there was any type of clues that could possibly determine this boy's identification. So, two, this is nuts, but 270 police academy recruitments they were told to help search for the case. So they're looking and looking all over the area and they ended up being the ones to help find several clues. They had found a men's blue cordu corduroy, corduroy, I'm sorry, I can't really talk, corduroy cap. And the cap was odd. It was like odd to find because like if someone's missing a hat, wouldn't you think you would go out and look for it? But this per it was just disregarded like nuts. And then it had a, there was a child scarf nearby, which drew a lot of police attention because the person, the body that had been found was the body of a little boy. So the fact that there was a child scarf there, like really started clicking things in for him. And the there was a man's white handkerchief, handkerchief or handkerchief, is it? Yeah, anyways, so with the it had the letter G embroidered on it. So the police they found these clues and they started trying to see if they could test for DNA or anything, and the clues ended up going nowhere. Which, if in my opinion, I feel like it's in order to help solve the case. I feel like there should be DNA testing this year or sometime soon just to get something off of the handkerchief or just the scarf or the blue corduroy cap just to see if it could lead them like anywhere that could possibly help identify this little boy. But 
I don't know. I don't know. I highly doubt that will happen. As much as I want it to, I highly doubt it will. So, like I said, none of the none of those clues led anywhere. So then, the police department and everything, they ended up dressing up the little boy in a nice suit and in a nice seated position to show what he may have looked like when he was alive to see if anyone would come forward and say, like, you know, they recognize this person in life. But unfortunately, nothing ever came from this. And to this day, still, this boy has not been identified. It still pisses me off. So there's multiple theories when it comes to the boy's case, like who might have killed him and who this person might have been. And all of them but two were dismissed. Two. And those are the two that we're going to talk about today. Y'all might want to buckle up because this is a crazy bride. Because when I was reading this and I uh, was reading about the two theories... I just got so pissed off because I was like, look, they are very valid theories and the police just won't look into it. <clears throat> so, the first thing that we're going to be talking about is the theory that this boy may have come from a foster home. So, the foster home that this boy may have come from was actually located one and a half miles away from where the boy's body was found. So, it's a probable thought. Like, it's a probable theory. It, it, very possible, especially considering no one's come to find him. And in 1960, a man named Remington Bristow, he got in contact with a psychic. And Remington Bristow was a, actually an employee of the local medical examiner's office. So he's one of the people that help, you know, with dead bodies and stuff. They help try to examine who this person might have been. Just try and get any type of clues that they could, essentially. So... He, like I said, he checked out with a psychic. And the psychic had told him, supposedly, to check out a house with the same description. The same description as the foster home. Hmm. Ain't that some shit, huh? So, she, the, she even, this person isn't even from the area. Not even from the state. Never even heard of this case or anything. And straight up, like, led this guy to like directly to the foster home which is like i said it's crazy because she's never even been there never even seen it nothing like she just knew where it was which i personally believe in psychics the real psychics you know like mediums and shit like long island medium that's a good show that's a very good show i believe in that type of shit but it's, i know some people really don't but i do personally so it is said that after Bristow, he attended an estate sale of the foster home. So, you know, what a estate sale is, is basically when you close down something or, and they're, they're trying to get rid of all the items of the house, like tables, chairs, dressers, TVs, whatever they may have. And so he ended up actually finding a bassinet that was similar to what was sold at JCPenney's, hence the box that the boy had been found in that said it had a bassinet sold from J.C. Penney's on the outside. Ain't that some shit though, right? It makes sense. Like everything's starting to piece together, you know? And the, the guy, Bristow, he even went inside of the foster home where they were having that big old estate sale and he found, get this, blankets outside hanging up on a clothesline that looked exactly li like what that little boy was wrapped up in mm-hmm mm -hmm. that's what i'm saying so then bristow he had he just came out like off the gun with a theory and he was trying the best that he could to get people to listen to it and like i said this theory makes a lot of sense and it's it's not an illogical concept so he basically said that the he believed that the boy might have been an Ill illegitimate child of the stepdaughter of the man who owned the foster house now if you don't know what illegitimate means it basically means like the stepdaughter and a man that she you know had relations with like had sex and everything they were not married, and that was very frowned upon back in the 1980s. So it is said that, you know, they could have just, like, had the boy killed 
because they were trying to raise it and make it seem like it was like a little brother or something. But, you know, or raised as a foster child. But either way, the boys got killed. And so, it, like I said, it was back in like the 1950s. And the society back in the 1950s, it was very frowned upon to be a single unwed mother. Like, it was like worse than not going to church on Sundays. I mean, like, that, it was, it was horrible. Like, that type of shit. Now, now, nowadays, you know, like, it's not uncommon to have unwed single mothers. You know, like, there's people out there that have kids at, like, 14. Not that I, like, agree with any of that, but it, it does happen. You know? So, the police, they 100% believe that the death of this child was unintentional. It was an accident. So, the police, they were unable to find any links between the foster family and the little boy. Which I'm just like, um, how about the box? How about the clothes? How about the blanket? Like, like it, that type of shit makes sense. Come on now. And the foster fam the foster father and the stepdaughter, they were ultimately interviewed by the police. And it wasn't said like what was said during the interview, but whatever was said was enough to them to close down the investigation on the foster family. Which given the evidence kind of pisses me off because it's just like what did they notice that caused them to close down the case like what the fuck dude like there's so many like so much evidence pointing to that the foster family theory that is just like what so then there became the other possible theory and this theory came from a woman named Martha, or how she wanted to be known as M, end quote. Now, this theory was brought forward in February of 2002. Like, this was years after the 1950s, right? Like, why the hell so long to come forward with this? I have no idea. But she was only wanted to be known as Martha. And the police... They consider the story to be a possibility, but then they're like, oh, but she has mental problems. She's got a history of mental disability, which just proves, goes to prove to you, like, how little mental illness is seen in society. Remember that mental illness, like, the history of mental illnesses in hospitals video that I did uh, a couple, a month or so ago? Yeah. Remember reading that shit where they completely overlooked that type of nonsense, treat everybody like shit back then? This is exactly what this makes me think of, and it just, it pisses me off. Because, like, just because someone has a mental illness doesn't mean that they're not lying. So, according to M, this is, this is all that's going on. The boy, like, oh, sorry, I lost track of where I was. The abusive mother had purchased the boy, his, his name was Jonathan from his birth parents back in mid-1954, which, like, makes me think, like, purchasing children is, was that actually a legit thing? Was, did people actually put their kids for sale? Because I know they did that back in the 30s because, you know, like, it was the Depression era. They all needed money. Hence, uh, there was one case that I read about, uh, uh, Marjorie West, it was a possibility that she was kidnapped and sold for money. You know what I'm talking about? Because back in, like, the 30s and everything. But, so, according to M, like, they kept, like, purchased this boy. The boy became subjected, apparently, to extreme abuse, neglect, and it was physical and sexual abuse for two and a half years, apparently. Meaning, around mid-1957, right before, like, this boy would have died. And so, according to M, the mother, aka the foster mother of the boy that was found in the box, according to M, according to M, she, he had, she had been like so pissed off at this boy, she started slamming his head in the ground of, like on the floor of their house until he became unconscious. And, which would make sense because she didn't even know that the cause of death was blunt force trauma. She didn't know any of this. And the death was ruled a homicide by beating. So that kind of like lines up right there. Right? Right? But, you know, this man's because of mental illness. Whatever. The boy Jonathan was then given a bath. Because they're like, okay, well, he's passed out. So let's maybe give him a bath and see if he'll wake up, right? 
but he died during the bath. So all the details matched information that was only known to the police at the time. This was not public information. Nobody knew about this, yet she did, which makes sense that she would have been there. Not only that, but she was able to identify that the boy's stomach had been filled with baked beans. The last meal he had was baked beans. His fingers were water wrinkled, which only proves that the uh, foster mother had put him into a bathtub to wake him up after he was beaten to death. So, M had said that her mother had given the boy a horrible haircut job in order to keep his identity un identity unknown because he had long hair like really long hair and it was shaved off to prevent his identity and then she had forced M to help dispose of the boy's body in Fox Chase which she stated now this this makes a lot of fucking sense listen to this she stated that as she and her mother were trying to take the body out of the car, a man had pulled over and tried to help assist them. And M was told to block the car's license plate so it wouldn't have been identified as their car. So that the mother could convince the man that pulled over that nothing's going on, nothing is wrong. And this was all considered confidential testimony that was actually given by a male who had witnessed the body being discarded at the scene. Nobody knew this except for the police. Now, ain't that some shit? There's no way she could have, like, there's no way she could have not, like, pulled this out of her ass. If, like, she had to have known something, right? I mean, it makes sense. It all makes sense. It all adds up together. So, what? Ew. So then, However, like the neighbors had said, I know you're behind me. The neighbors had said that there was not even, like they had never even witnessed a child even being at the home. So they were like, whatever she's saying is bullshit. It's bullshit. And there had never been a young boy living there, which made me think like maybe the boy was locked up, like chained up downstairs, which would make sense because, you know, no one was allowed to see him and no one had noticed there was a guy there so there's also another theory was that the victim had been raised to be a girl the mother shut up <laughs> the haircut was performed in such haste skill oh, i love you too and his mm -hmm. eyebrows were even styled like a girl's and there was even a 2008 sketch of what the victim may have looked like with long hair which actually coincides with uh, the long hair strands that were found on the body. So it is possible that this boy was raised as a girl, had his hair cut off whenever he died, so his identity would never be known because everyone knew him like as a girl. It could have made sense, like seriously. And in 2016, a man named Jim Hoffman and another ma man named Louis Ramona, he announced, they announced they had a potential identity. And I was like, oh shit go ahead you know like I'm reading into this and I'm like oh so the identity the potential identity came from Memphis Tennessee and they had requested that DNA from the family in Memphis Tennessee be compared to that of the boy found in Fox Chase Pennsylvania and unfortunately in December of 2017 the homicide detective sergeant Bob Kohlheimer's Kohlmeyer, Kohlmeyer, yes, Kohlmeyer, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, it was like completely German to me. They confirmed that there was not a positive match between the Memphis man and the boy in the box, which really like upset everybody because they were all hoping that this case would be solved. And now it's just like, really? Really? Now they're all like so sad. I mean, I'm personally sad. I'm really hoping that this case gets solved one day because it deserves it. I mean, this poor boy, the, since the 50s. Oh, so now we're going to be talking about the burial. So the boy was at, in the box was actually buried in a potter's field. So a potter's field is basically a, a place for the burial of unknown or unclaimed bodies. Or it's a place where like indig 
indignant indignant people like indigenous people used to live you know that's where they would that's how they used to bury their bodies back in the day so they um ended up getting dna from enamel on a tooth and then he was reburied back at the ivy hill cemetery in cedarbrook philadelphia pennsylvania and it's said that the headstone the coffin and the funeral service was all actually donated by the son of the man who actually buried him back in 1957. Ain't that some shit? Very interesting. So my thoughts were about this case that regardless of mental history, but remember this was the 50s, everyone just like that was told they had mental illness was like treated as trash. My theory is that M was telling the truth because then again, remember she had like told everyone details about she had told the police details that only they knew. They didn't know they knew about the baked beans in the stomach, the waterlogged fingers and everything. They knew about all that and the fact that there was long hair strands on him. She did not like how else would she have known? No one else has seen it unless like, and it's not, it wasn't public information either. So not everybody knew it. So, it, but like the fact that she was discarded because she had mental illness. And this was again, back in 2000 something. Why don't they find M again? And they see if she can remember it. Cause seriously, like this all makes fucking sense and nobody seems to care. And the fact that the boy could have been purchased, like there was a big ring um, her th I think her name was Georgia Tan. Yes, Georgia Tan would kidnap small children and babies and then sell them, you know, or take children from people who couldn't afford to have them and sell them to other families, which could make sense if the, bo the boy was purchased, like M had said, by the mother. And the mother, who was abusive towards him, probably didn't think much of him because he wasn't a real child or whatever. Again, that's just my thoughts and opinions. I would love to know yours down below in the comment section. Please like, comment, subscribe, share this video. Let this video be known so that one day that this boy may be identified. Until then, my name is Caitlin Elliott. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye!